all set? Okay, great. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Thanks to the generosity of the Russell Sage Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and Duke University. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you back to SIX, the Summer Institute in Computational Social Science. Um, hello to everybody following along on the live stream. Um, and um, I just want to reiterate for those of you who maybe are tuning in uh, to this topic uh, today on um, automated text analysis about how things work here and how you can access the course materials. So if you're on our website here, um, you can Google Summer Institute in Computational Social Science. It should be the first link that comes up. And if you click on Schedule and Materials here, you'll see we're now on Wednesday. And we're going to begin here with the slides for History of Quantitative Text Analysis. Um, and we'll be following along both with slides and also annotated code um, that includes um, code chunks or worked examples with notes that explain how to perform all the things I'll be doing up on the live screen. And again, the, the point of that is to relieve you from um, taking notes. Okay, so let's begin with a history of quantitative text analysis. Um, and before we do that, though, let me show you what we've got on the agenda for today. Uh, we are going to, after we talk about the history of quantitative text analysis, we're going to go over um, a bunch of stuff that most people don't know they need to know in order to do text analysis. These are things like character encoding, tokenization, stemming. If these words are new to you, um, this first part of the lecture is going to be essential for you to learn how to, essentially, to learn how to transform, transform words into numbers. Okay? Uh, then we're going to talk about dictionary-based methods. These are methods where we have kind of a known um, uh, subject we want to measure in a text, and we think we can measure them by counting certain words. Um, then we have our break. Then we'll go over both uh, topic models, latent Dirichlet allocation, and a somewhat new variant of uh, topic modeling called structural topic modeling. And we'll have another very short break. And then before lunch, we're going to go over text networks, which is a new, new technique, um, a new alternative to topic modeling um, for um, uh, automated text analysis that's going to combine some new, more cutting edge tools like part of speech tagging and sentiment analysis alongside some more conventional network-based approaches. OK, finally, um, uh, we're going to have a group exercise today where we all work on the same corpus of tweets um, and try to come back together um, either here at Duke or at your local institute to, um, to uh, uh, discover themes in that corpus. And tonight, um, not here, but at Kellogg, there is a live stream lecture. Uh, by Ned Smith, he's a very interesting faculty member at Kellogg, uh, the School of Management, who is uh, doing really interesting work at the intersection of social psychology and social network analysis. Okay, so one of the things that really amazes me about quantitative text analysis is just how much was doing was being done um, in the 1930s. Um, you know, we all like to talk about the latest and greatest neural net, or you know word to vec or what have you. Um, but if you do some digging, um, as I was inclined to do uh, before I made this lecture last year, you discover that people like Harold Laswell, the political scientist, um, after, uh, largely after the First World War, was, uh, was writing stuff like this. Um, we may classify references into categories according to the understanding which prevails among those who are accustomed to the symbols. References used in interviews may be quantified by counting the number of references which fall into each category during a selected period of time or per thousand words uttered. So in other words, this is, to, to my knowledge, the first attempt to quantify text analysis. Now what he's describing is somewhat primitive, right? Counting which words are uttered when. Um, but on the other hand, um, many folks don't know um, that Laswell also had people hooked up to heart rate monitor machines and was, was measuring physiometric um, properties of people as they spoke. 
uh, and measuring things like emotional activation around words. His interest, of course, in this uh, initial post-war period was around propaganda. Um, later, um, as we'll see in, 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 the, in the aftermath of the Second World War, um, security concerns also drove text analysis. So, you know, ahead of his time, in 1935, and at the age of 21, Laswell was developing methods that track the association between, between words uttered and, and physiological reactions. Just a, just a reminder um, that, you know, there are many who came before us. Um, you know, or, or another great example is, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the neural network, which, you know, now everything needs a neural net, right? Well, neural nets have been around since 1950. Um, what's changed? Um, computing power, right? And so, of course, that has implications for, for how we work with text. Um, but it's good to remember um, some of the genealogy of the ideas. And so let's take a moment to look at the, uh, the timeline here. This is probably an imperfect effort. Um, as, as you'll see, the timeline here spans many different fields, um, including um, political science, sociology, um, computational linguistics, linguistics, computer science, information science, psychology, now machine learning, whatever that is, right? Um, and, um, you know, we can go back, actually some of the early pioneers, so Laswell's a political scientist, Gotsky is a, uh, actually a, a, hum, uh, a literary theorist, Gottschalk, the psychologist, uses content analysis to track Freudian themes in texts, and of course a big game changer uh, was Turin in the 1950s. Some of the initial applications, actually some initial um, uh, early development of AI, artificial intelligence, was in the realm of text and especially text translation. Again, just by way of backstory, a lot of this had to do with the urgent need to translate foreign texts into other languages in the context of World War II and the aftermath of World War II. Um, and so a lot of these early efforts were trying to train, um, train some of the first natural language models. Didn't really become institutionalized until 1952. We started to have um, textbooks about content analysis. People were slowly and gradually beginning to be trained in content analysis. 1954, we have the first successful automated translation of a text. 1963, again, some early uh, political science pioneers um, use uh, quantitative techniques to analyze the Federalist Papers. Uh, and again, more formalization of narrative analysis in quantitative format by literary theorists such as Tomaszewski here. And then um, we go into the 1960s and 70s, and um, what changes? Well, again, neural nets have been around. A lot of the principles of AI have been around, but computing power is changing rapidly, right? So uh, Stone and Bales used the first, no relation, used the first mainframe computer to measure psychometric properties of text at RAND, right? Um, and then, then there's a really big moment. So, um, you know, the, 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 the famous linguist Noam Chomsky at this time is really producing what is viewed by many as a single theory of human language, right? That could be used to explain and interpret any utterance um, given universal laws of, of language, right? And at the same time, um, people are kind of figuring out that that might not be possible, that that might have been a little bit of a reach, a general theory that could always infer uh, the meaning of a text given its relationship or its adjacency, say, to other words, right? People continuously realize that, um, you know, in natural language use, words take on different meaning based upon their co-appearance alongside other words, um, and that um, words are highly context-based, and that there is polysemy, that is that words can mean different things to different people at different points in time, right? And here's where the, the, the field of natural language processing is born um, alongside advances in computer science, the field of computational linguistics is born, um, the first part of speech taggers um, come on at large scale, and these types of things become used by political scientists and others doing automated event coding. Uh, another big development is 
Um, the linguistic inquiry word count software is created in the 1980s as an attempt to measure sort of universal psychometric properties of text. And finally, some exciting things start to happen in network analysis by Roberto Franzosi and others. And really, it wasn't until the 1990s that we started to talk about topic modeling. Um, one of the classic papers written in the Journal of Machine Learning by, by uh, David Blay. Um, but around the same time, sociologists uh, such as Peter Bierman, um, Jim Moody, John Moore are also developing network-based approaches for text analysis. 2003, we get more infrastructure like Mallet, which is a system, one of the early systems for running topic models on text. And then slowly and gradually, somewhere around 2010, um, you know, uh, when I was really beginning my career, um, you saw um, that, you know, these, these methods just vault into the mainstream. Um, topic modeling, um, sentiment analysis, um, really um, started to show up in a lot, in a lot of journals. Um, in some disciplines earlier than others in social science, um, but really came to be viewed as, as, as a, a really major and important tool in the social scientist toolkit. And, um, you know, there was at the same time, you know, a bit of a hype cycle, right? So yesterday we talked about some of the strengths and weaknesses of digital trace data. And we talked a lot about how many people were arguing at one point that the, uh, the size and the scale and the, and, the, and the various strengths of big data meant that we won't need theory anymore, right? Um, and, and we talked about why we don't think that's wrong. We thought what, we, we think we might need more theory, right? Um, well, the same kind of thing is happening in text analysis. People are saying, well, now, you know, now we don't need to read anything anymore. And now we don't need to, uh, you know, at the ex in the extreme version of this, now we don't need to do interviews anymore. Um, and we don't need qualitative researchers, right? And now, um, you know, those of us who have been involved in kind of bringing or trying to import these, message, these, these methods into mainstream social science um, have very quickly realized that, that these methods will not do that. Um, you know, the analogy I love uh, is from David Blay. You know, if you talk to him about um, topic modeling, he'll say it's a tool for reading, right? Machines are not yet at the, at the point where they are going to do the interpretation for us. We, you know, with some assumptions and, and with some, um, some patience, we can do great things, and we, and we will do great things today. Um, but we, we, need to, we need to put some, some cold water on some of the hype cycle and, again, try to reach the, the plateau of pro productivity um, that Matt and I have been talking about uh, for the whole week. Okay. So... It's an inherently interdisciplinary field. I'm sure I left some people out. Um, if, those, if those of you watching or here have some, some additional events left out, please slack them and we'll, we'll add them for, uh, for the uh, website. <clears throat>